you wouldn't go into major surgery without getting a second opinion. Don't go into your fantasy football draft without getting one from me. Bad news, high ankle sprain. You're out of luck for two to four weeks. That's not what Chart says, Doc. It's the Fantasy Victory Draft Special, number one, with Paul Charchian and Paul Allen. Get ready to dominate your fantasy football league right now. Hey, everybody. I'm Paul Allen, voice of the Minnesota Vikings. Thanks for joining us for Fantasy Victory 2014. And I am Paul Charchian, fantasy football expert and commissioner of LeagueSafe.com. Tonight, we'll break down the hot topics of quarterbacks and running backs and let you know which players are possible torpedoes, guys that could sink your team and possibly your entire season. Now, in recent years, the NFL has gone from a running back dominated ground game to a pass happy league mm. that begins and ends with the quarterback. So let's get started by going deep ourselves and break down quarterbacks, which is provided by Fairview Health Services. Here are, the, uh, here are this year's top five quarterbacks, beginning with Peyton Manning. Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees, Matthew Stafford, and uh, Matt Ryan. What do you think? Yeah, let's. Uh, I, I, in my mind, after the top three guys, you got Manning, Rodgers, and Brees, Paul, those three guys are worth spending a first or second round pick on in your draft. But after that, it starts getting into a category where there's a lot of the same guy. And I, if I don't end up with Manning, Rodgers, or Brees, I'm waiting. And I'm going to go into the second or third tier of guys that we'll talk about in a second. Hey, Paulie, with the first overall pick in fantasy drafts, people talk about wide receivers, running backs, yeah. maybe even Jimmy Graham if you really want to stretch. Peyton Manning was the highest scoring player in fantasy football last year. He's the top-ranked quarterback right now. Could he also be in consideration for the top overall pick? You know, he really isn't, in, in part because the quarterbacks are all so similar. And as dominating as he was last year, you feel like he can't possibly do that again. And it's so much harder to get players at other positions. Again, you can get a lot of quarterbacks that are going to perform well. And there's even a case out there where Rodgers or Brees outperforms Manning this year. So, no, I don't think, I, even though he was the highest scoring player last year, I don't think he goes first this year. Back to the list here are the rest of the top ten. And you'll notice Paul Charchian has Jay Cutler yeah. from the Chicago Bears ranked sixth. That's pretty high. Why? Yeah, you hate that, don't you, Paul? Uh, I'm impervious. All right. This Jay Cutler, he's got two top ten wideouts. He's got the best pass-catching running back in the league. And here's how I think Jay Cutler goes to 35 touchdowns this year, Paul. Jeez. Brandon Marshall is good for 12, and that might be conservative. Alshon Jeffrey, good for 10. Mm -hmm. That might be conservative. Matt Forte, good for maybe six. Tight end, Martellus Bennett's good for like four. And that means everybody else only has to be good for three. And the rest of the roster, now we're at 35 touchdowns. So that's how I think Jay Culler ends up with that kind of ranking. Those of you watching Fantasy Victory, remember, get sneaky, draft everyone else in round six. That's the actual name. We're through <laughs> the top ten without hitting up some big-name quarterbacks, you know, those Super Bowl contenders and surefire Hall of Famers. How about Tom Brady, Captain Cool for the New England Patriots? Yeah. Colin Kaepernick there, Brady at 15. Is Tom still an elite fantasy quarterback? You know, he really wasn't last year. You know, in a typical scoring system last season, he finished oh, somewhere between Jake Locker and Ryan Tannehill Jeez. in fantasy points per game last year. That's, uh, that's really dice. He only had two games with more than two touchdown passes, Paul. So without a huge upgrade at wide receiver this season, I don't, I don't know that Tom Brady is going back to being an elite fantasy quarterback, and that's why you're seeing him ranked in the teens. All right, let's head into second string territory now. Quarterbacks 16 through 20. Carson Palmer, Arizona Cardinals, down to Sam Bradford from St. Louis. I know you have a sneaky opinion on Sam Bradford, don't you? You know, I do have a, a sneaky opinion on Sam Bradford. In the games in which he was healthy last year, which there weren't a lot of them, but you can see the numbers on your screen now, he was on pace, Paul, for a 30-touchdown season. 30, yeah. Sam Bradford. And so I really started to think we started to turn the corner on Sam Bradford. And, you know, that's why I, I'm optimistic now with Kenny Britt that he's going to have a better season and hopefully a longer season than the one he had last year. Yeah, and keep in mind, Sam Bradford plays in a really, really tough division with a lot of good defenses. True. Johnny Manziel, the rookie for the Cleveland Browns. Johnny Football has captivated a lot of football fans' attention already this year. But is Johnny Football ready to make the jump from the amateurs to the pros, and Willie put up gaudy numbers for the Cleveland Browns. What do you think about Johnny football? You, you know, Paul, my my sense here is that if it's the last pick of your draft, absolutely throw a, throw a, a flyer at Johnny Manziel, but you can't count on him. Here's what we know for sure. And by the way, he looked good in the, in the first uh, preseason game last weekend. And I'm optimistic that he's going to end up engineering a, a, a competent Cleveland offense, but there's so many variables here. 
You know, what he's really going to help fantasy guys is on the ground with his feet. And I think Johnny Manziel is going to get you rushing touchdowns and some rushing yards, and that'll make up for the passing deficiencies that we all believe that he's got right now at this stage of his career. And before you move on Johnny football, make sure you stay in touch with the updated Josh Gordon news. And remember, mm -hmm. their offensive coordinator, Norv Turner, is now with the Minnesota Vikings. All right, we all like to compete with our friends in fantasy football and talk some smack on social media. Wouldn't it feel good to beat this guy, Paul Charchian? Go to fantasyvictory.com to play the free weekly Grain Belt Premium Crush Charge Challenge. You can win great prizes every week and attend my end of year Grain Belt Fantasy Bash. We'll be back. Dominate all opponents. The Fantasy Victory Draft Special is back. Welcome back, Paul Charchian. It happens every single season. It's draft day, you're excited. There's the big name player that you've wanted, and he goes on to have an awful mm. season. In <laughs> yes. fact, he sinks your season and your team. We call those the torpedoes. Boo. Yep, our first underwater missile, Cam Newton. Can he have success with the dearth of wideouts in Carolina? Cam Newton. Yeah, his starting wideouts are Jericho Cotri and Kelvin Benjamin. Benjamin, to his credit, is huge. Six foot five, Ooh. 245 pounds. He's not going to run past defenders, but big, big body. And what's great about him, Paul, huge catch radius with that size. And Cal uh, Cam Newton is an inaccurate passer. So this is a guy who can haul in his catches. You know, and I, I like that part of it. But where Cam really hurts you, I think, is the week in and week out consistency. You know, the receivers are big question marks right now. And, you know, if, when he scores a rushing touchdown, Cam's great and he helps your fantasy team. Yep. When he doesn't, he hurts you because he doesn't do enough with his arm. So let me ask you this then. It yep. gets to your fantasy playoffs. You get in behind Cam. You need to win three straight weeks in your mm. fantasy playoffs to get to the championship. Is Cam Newton going to run in three straight balls? I, you know, unlikely. One, so one that's why I don't like him. One thing to take note with Cam Newton early in the season last year, they made a concerted effort to make him a pocket quarterback. Yeah. And it wasn't working. Then they switched to Cam, just go ahead and be who you are. And he was pretty good after that. Another potential torpedo is in the same division. He's Tampa Bay Buccaneers running back Doug Martin. What do you think of him? I'm nervous about Doug Martin for a few different reasons. Uh, number one, Doug Martin was great for about two-thirds of his, of his rookie year. And then if you look at the, the latter portion of his rookie year and the six games he played last year, totally ordinary. I mean, look at just last year's number you see on your screen right now. Six games, one touchdown, one 100-yard game. Mm. That was it for Doug Martin. I'm not sure. He's a special runner. He's coming back from significant injury. And the offensive line isn't that good. They, add, they, they drafted a backup behind him who could steal goal line carries. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of me that's very nervous about Doug Martin. I'm seeing him, see him going way too high in fantasy drafts. I've got him ranked at round number 18, so I'm showing a lot of caution on him. And his most likely quarterback, Josh McCown, be careful with him. He leaves Mark Tressman's offense in Chicago where he had a lot of success. Mm -hmm. uh, it may not be as good going for Josh McCown in Tampa. Final torpedo, let's go to the New England Patriots. It's that guy, Julian Edelman. My concern, Paul, and Julian Edelman is that everything went his way last year. He stayed healthy, which he never does. Gronkowski missed most of the season. That's probably unusual. Well, we hope unusual. There were no other receivers to throw to. You had rookies and Dobson and Kemberl Tompkins. It was just nobody else to throw to but Edelman. Everything broke his way. I don't know that he can do that again. It just feels like he caught lightning in a bottle last season and caught a lot of passes, didn't convert that into a lot of touchdowns and a lot of yards. I, I worry that we could be in a situation this year where the receptions go down and you get even fewer yards and touchdowns. I'm nervous about Julian Edelman. Remember those guys. Stay away from those torpedoes. It can ruin everything. Let's debut a new segment. We call it Big Movers mm. and pointing out a player who has made the biggest leap forward this season on people's draft lists. And the winner this week is... New York Giants rookie Andre Williams. Nice. Andre, big, big kid, Paul. And he is going to be the goal line back in a Tom Coughlin offense that has always had a split carry uh, situation where they've got a designated goal line back. Yep. It's going to be Andre Williams this year. He's gigantic. Rashad Jennings will get the bulk of the carries on first, second down, but the tough yards and change of pace will be Andre Williams. He's moving up quickly, and actually, I think it's deserved. I love that name. Let's take a quick time out. When we return, the doctor is in the house with the Fairview Fantasy Rehab. We'll take a look at the crucial position of running back and cover some of the big name players. More coming up, it's Fantasy Victory. Make the right pick. The Fantasy Victory Draft Special continues.
Welcome back to Fantasy Victory. It is time for our Fantasy Rehab section with Dr. Grant Morrison, sports medicine physician at Fairview. Dr. Morrison, we got a couple of fantasy relevant injury questions for you. I want to start with an injury that happened to the Bengals. It's a broken foot, the fifth meta, metatarsal mm -hmm. uh, for Marvin Jones. Tell me a little bit about this broken foot, and especially because there are ranges of recovery time that I'm seeing anywhere from six weeks to 12 weeks. Tell me a little bit about broken foot and the fifth metatarsal. The notorious fifth metatarsal. Yes. Well, it depends. The fifth metatarsal is a long bone. It's, it's equivalent to the last bone in the palm of your hand along the pinky area. Mm. And um, so it's a wide extent. So it depends on where the fracture is. Now, it sounds like this, ironically, may be a Jones fracture. Yeah, from Marvin, Marvin Jones. Jones. Right, right. Now, the Jones fracture is a, is a very particular part of the bone. It's the, the closest part to the ankle. Mm -hmm. It's only about, the, if, if you look at your pinky, from the, from the knuckle onward. So about, uh, about a centimeter and a half. Okay. And that's an area that has really poor healing. It, it has poor blood flow, so it doesn't heal very well. Yeah. So if that's truly where the fracture is, this could be a three-month process. If it's anywhere else in the bone, it can be a six-week, four-week process even. All so. right. And leave it to an NFL team like the Bengals to not be completely honest with us on exactly you know, where the break is. Uh, talk to me about hamstring injuries. They tend to have a recovery timetable. It can be a couple of days or a couple of weeks. Well, they, they probably all take several weeks. They just, the problem is that people feel so much better so quickly. Ah. And when you get to an athlete, it depends on power and speed. Mm -hmm. That's where you're going to tweak those muscles so much more quickly. Um, it's a it's a runnering it's an injury that runners don't have. They have overuse injuries. They have tendonitis. Yeah. But uh, but a, a powerful athlete that depends on muscle power to get going, that that hamstring muscle is key to to getting uh, uh, strength and power. So a sprinter like in the Olympics is, you'll see this often. Mm -hmm. They'll pull up, grab their back of the leg, and yeah. they can't walk. Most football players require power and speed. So but they quickly heal, relatively speaking, over a few weeks. But the recurrence rate is is the problem. And even when they feel better, and the pain's gone, the swelling is gone, the bruising's gone, it takes a long time to get back to full strength and full power without risking a recurrence. Thank you, Doctor. We will talk to you more uh, about fantasy-related injuries in our next shows as well. Well, I thought that was very classy of Paul Charchian to dress up for the good doctor, wear that tie. And now mm -hmm. we get back to the loosey-goosey feel of Fantasy Victory and the fantasy stuff. Because this year, we have the Fantasy Victory TV show. We have the app for both Apple and Droid. And that? this year, we yeah. also have the Fantasy Victory Now option, a series of weekly web clips that will be updated every week. A couple of times a week, as a matter of fact. Indeed, it's sponsored by the good people at Grain Belt. Mm -hmm. Charge will continue to break things down for you week by week throughout the entire National Football League season. All right, on to the running backs, yep. a very important spot in fantasy football. This position is known to dominate early in drafts. Can we expect this season to be like previous seasons? Well, yes and no, Paul. Uh, the first four picks should be a running back. You want to have some combination of Adrian Peterson, Jamal Charles, uh, LaShawn McCoy or Matt Forte. Those should be the first four picks, I think, in every draft. Those should be the four highest dollar players in an auction. But after that, Paul, I really think you want to get away from most of the other running backs right. that are going to be early in that first round. You know, I've always espoused doing the opposite, where you don't take uh, running backs early except for those elite guys. But this year, I think people are really listening to that. We're seeing guys like Calvin Johnson and Demarius Thomas and Jimmy Graham and Peyton Manning uh, Drew Brees, uh, uh, A.J. Green, Des Bryant, all go in the first round. I love I love to see some non-quarterbacks going in that position. Denver's running back Monte, Monte Ball is listed mm. as your biggest risk. Let's take a look at uh, Monte Ball. He's the biggest risk-reward player, that is. Yeah. Why? And by risk-reward, I mean this is a guy with tremendous upside and potentially downside. Your downside is that we don't have a, a, a real clear sense of, of what he can bring to the table. He doesn't have a long track record, but we know the opportunity in Denver is ridiculous. He was a phenomenal touchdown scoring machine at Wisconsin. Last year, didn't get asked to do a lot, but this year he's set up as the clear-cut number one player despite an appendectomy and enters the season potentially, Paul, as the guy, if everything breaks the right way, who will score the most touchdowns in the well, NFL. Let's move on to Marshawn Lynch. Do you think he's safe to draft? I do, and if people are concerned about his usage going down, and it will go down, but even if it goes down, you know, 20%, it's still good numbers for him, and I think people are a little too sour on Marshawn Lynch. Uh, could be a timeshare there for him. Let's move on to the NFC North. The yeah. Detroit Lions have a trio of options in their backfield. Who's the best, and would you, how would you draft these guys? Bush, Joyke Bell, and Player Du Jour. Yeah, <laughs> Player Du Jour would be Theo Riddick. A lot of people don't know about him, but he's a Darren Sproles type. I like Joyke Bell. 
Joyke Bell was money at the goal line last year, and I think there's a chance in this new offense he turns in to the featured back with Reggie Bush being more of a role player. Toby Gerhardt leaves the Vikings, goes to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Optimistic. Didn't look great in the preseason so far, but optimistic that as a guy who's going to get most of the work, that he can generate some fantasy points despite a middling offense. I like the fact that he's going to get most of the carries, though. One of your favorites hails from Cincinnati, yeah. Giovanni Bernard. He was a terrific receiver out of the backfield for the Bengals last year, mm -hmm. but he was only a part-time guy. Do you think that changes this year? Tragically, no. Jeez. I wish it was going to be that case, but they drafted a talented big-bodied uh, rookie in uh, uh, Jerome Hill, and he is going to end up taking a lot of the goal line use. He's going to be this year's Ben Jarvis Green Ellis, unfortunately, and that's going to create a problem for Giovanni Bernard for fantasy use. And I love Bernard. He's a super talented guy, but the fact is he is small, Paul. You know, he's like five foot seven. So you just, there's just so much pounding he's going to be able to take. As, and I, I think they're going to be cautious with him again this year. Alfred Morris of the Washington Redskins. Very intriguing, very talented yeah. back. Down season last year, new coach in Jay Gruden. What do you think? Well, they vowed to throw to Alfred Morris more often, and that will certainly help. He's not an incapable receiver, Paul, but he's still mostly a grinder as a running back. But what I find interesting here is that Jay Gruden goes over from Cincinnati, where he used the aforementioned Giovanni Bernard and Ben Jarvis Green Ellis as a dual-headed backfield. Yeah. I wonder if he's not going to do that with Roy Hallou and use Hallou as his pass-catching back and a guy that's more of a change of pace back than he's been in the past and that Morris's numbers go down. And RG3 still a run first quarterback. Time for our last break. Coming up, Charge explains the Empire League yeah. format and we will shoot off some fast-paced questions via the two-minute drill. Prep your victory dance. The Fantasy Victory Draft Special returns. Welcome back. There are mega options when playing fantasy football, and you've created an interesting twist, Paul Charchian. It's called the Empire League. It Explain is. it. Yeah, the Empire League is a development that I've dreamed up, Paul, because too many fantasy leagues end out of just kind of people get bored, you get tired of the same guys, maybe there was some kind of controversy. There's not really a, a, a real ending to a league. So what I took is the Dynasty League idea, where you keep everybody over the course of your entire roster year to year, but the special thing about an Empire League, instead of paying out all of the entry fee funds to the winners in that year, you only pay out half, you roll the other half forward from year to year, waiting for somebody to win twice. Yep. When they win back to back, then... You pay out all of those accumulated winnings, and the league ends. Crunch time, two-minute warning, clock's winding down, we need to make plays. Let's begin with a sneaky kicker to make the last pick in the draft. How about the Vikings kicker, Paul? Blair Walsh. I, I see this Viking offense being much better. Blair remains an elite, deep kicker. And so Blair Walsh, a guy that I think is a great last pick of your draft. Give me a defense. St. Louis Rams have got the best defensive line in football. They're going to accumulate a lot of sacks, and when you get that much quarterback pressure, you usually also get fumbles and interceptions. Which running back leads the league in receptions? Jamal Charles. The, the Chiefs just have nobody else to throw to. Dwayne Bow looks like you know, he's suffering through a finger injury and a lot of other problems, so I think it's going to be out of necessity. Jamal Charles in uh, Kansas City. I need some good handcuffs. Hurry. Handcuffs that matter. Chris Polk for the, for the uh, Philadelphia Eagles. Niall Davis for the Chiefs. Trey Mason for St. Louis. James Starks for Green Bay. Kristen Michael for Seattle. Those all sound like good handcuffs to me. Which team will score the fewest points in the league? Five seconds. Um, Oakland. The Oakland Raiders, he says. That's going to do it for the first installment of Fantasy Victory. We'll be back next Wednesday with more elite fantasy information. Charge PA. Bye-bye. <laughs>